Welcome to this YSL Excel VBA tutorial. This video is going to give you a brief introduction to working with strings in VBA, which is something you've probably done countless times already if you've got to this point in this tutorial series. This video is designed to give you a little bit more of a background about some of the specifics of working with strings. So we're going to start by talking about how to declare string variables using a couple of different styles of declaration. And then we'll talk about fixed length and variable length strings and what the difference is and why both are useful. We'll explain how you can convert values of different types into strings, which in VBA in most cases happens implicitly anyway, there's not much you need to do there. We'll also talk about how you can deal with nulls, which is one thing that you can't convert into a string. We'll spend a little time talking about concatenation and talk about two different operators you can use to concatenate strings in VBA. We'll also talk about string constants, things like special characters like uh, tab characters and new line characters, and give you an explanation as to why there are so many different types of new line constants. So we'll talk about new lines, CRLF, CR and LF by themselves, and explain the history of those and why they're um, the way they are. We'll talk a little bit towards the end of the video about comparing strings as well, including how to deal with case sensitive strings. And then the last part of the video is going to talk about using wildcards and pattern matching. So you can do elaborate things like find strings that start with or end with or contains or don't contain, etc, etc. So there's quite a lot to do here, although lots of the ideas are quite simple and you may have encountered them before, but let's get stuck in. Okay, so the starting point for this video is our fairly standard workbook full of data all about movies. I'll put a link in the video description in case you wanted to download a copy of the exact same data that I'm working with, although that's not absolutely necessary to work with the examples in this video. That might take a couple of days for the link to appear as well, so if you were desperate to get started, and I'm absolutely certain you are desperate to get started, then we have used a very similar data set in a previous video, and there's a link in the, uh, in the description of that video on our website that you can use to download the same data. Anyway, once you have got a copy of the data, we're going to head straight into the VB Editor. So if I head to the Developer tab, of course, and choose Visual Basic, or press Alt and F11, insert a new module, and then I'm going to start with a very simple subroutine called Basic Strings. Now this video is designed to try to give you as complete an understanding as possible of strings in VBA. So although it's going to seem a little bit patronising at this point, particularly if you have worked in VBA for quite a while, we're going to start with the absolute basic principles of what strings actually are. So in VBA, string is just the name of the data type for any value which contains text. The most common reason you're likely to use the word string in your code is when you're declaring a variable to hold a string. So for example, you can say dim s as string, and you'll have done similar things to that across many different examples if you've followed this video tutorial so far. That variable now can accept any string value, so it might be a literal string that you type in, or it could be a string value of a property of an object, for instance the name of the workbook or the address of a cell. But commonly if you wanted to enter a literal string and store that in a variable, you'd say s equals, and then for literal, literal strings, beg your pardon, you'd enter those in a set of double quotes. And inside your double quotes you can pretty much type in anything you like. It doesn't really matter at this point, it's treated as a, as a string of text. There is a bit of a limit to how bigger string you can hold. It's up to about 2.147 billion characters, where it should be more than enough for any literal string that you want to store. I'm certainly not about to test that by typing in 2.147 billion characters, that would be a pretty boring video. But if you've done that and you wanted to see that that value does get stored in the variable, a simple way to do that is to view the locals window from the view menu, so if I choose view locals window, then if I use the F8 key to step through this procedure, if I click anywhere in there, use F8 to step through, you'll see that the value that you've entered gets stored in that variable as a string. Now there are also lots of methods and properties in VBA that return strings. So for example, the path property of the workbook object, that returns a string that indicates the folder path in which the file is currently stored. So if I said s equals this workbook dot path, one way to tell that this property does return a string is once you've typed the property in is to press Ctrl and I while the cursor is in contact with the word path, and a little tooltip should pop up indicating that it does indeed return its value as a string. So I can do that for the path of the workbook. I could say something like s equals application.version. That returns the version number of the application, but it's returned as a string. Again, pressing Ctrl and I indicates that it returns a string. Then I could say something like s equals, uh, let's see, something like active sheet dot name. So I know the name of the worksheet that I'm currently sitting on. Um, I could also say s equals 
active cell dot address so I know what cell reference I'm I'm currently sitting in if I press Control and I at the end of the address property that's a slightly more complex property it has a number of parameters but they're all optional so I don't need to pass anything into these parameters but the important thing again is that it returns a string at the end so if I were to just use the F8 key to step through this now you'll, you'll be able to see the value of your string variable changing as you go through so you can see that you can return different strings and store those in a basic string variable now you don't actually have to be all that careful about what type of data you store in a string variable. VBA has a feature referred to as implicit type conversion. And all that means in simple terms is that if you have a variable with one data type and you attempt to store a value of a different data type in that variable, if the type of the value can be converted into the type of the variable, then VBA will handle that for you automatically. So just to demonstrate that really quickly, let's have another couple of lines, something that says s equals 1, 2, 3, so that's clearly a numeric value, and I could also say s equals, then I'm going to enter a date value here, so I'm going to put in 19 slash 02 slash 2017, which is today's date. If I enter that into in hash marks, then it's treated as a date value. It'll also flip around the, uh, the, the formatting, so it's month, day, year in VBA, which uh, may have tripped you up in the past. If I were to then just comment out the other lines of code there, and I can then use the F8 key to step through, you'll see the value 123 gets inserted into a set of double quotes, so that's um, clearly a literal string now rather than a, a numeric value. And then the date that I'm entering there, that gets converted into a string as well. And you can see that when it's converted into a string, it's using the regional settings of my computer. It's 19 slash 2 slash 2017, if you can just about make that out. The same is true for properties and methods that return strings or other data types. If I just end that procedure and then let's say something like s equals, let's find a property that returns a number. So let's say active cell dot row. So the row property doesn't return a string. If I press Ctrl and I, it returns a value as the long type, which is a long integer, which is a, a number up to about 2.147 billion. I can do the same sort of thing for, um, let's go for something slightly different, s equals um, this workbook dot sheets dot count. A count property always returns a numeric value. If I press Control and I, that returns its value as a long again. I could also try to store the result of the date function in my string variable. So I can say s equals date, which will try to calculate today's date. And once again, if I were to just comment out these two lines and then use f8 to step through, you should see that we've got the value 1 stored for the row number of the active cell, then again the number 1 stored for the number of sheets in the workbook, and then today's date again stored as the uh, the string value of today's date. So basically just to demonstrate that you can effectively store pretty much any value you like in a string variable. It doesn't matter whether it's a number or a date or a piece of text, strings will pretty much happily hold them. Now although you can rely happily on implicit type conversion in most cases, there are one or two situations where that falls over. You'll see one or two examples a little later on in this video. But just for now, to demonstrate the principle of explicit type conversion, every data type in VBA has a type conversion function. So the one that will convert values to strings explicitly in VBA is called CSTR, convert to string. So just to demonstrate that very quickly, we can say, rather than just saying active cell dot row and relying on VBA to convert the long to a string, we could say str. CSTR, then open some parentheses, and you'll see, of course, that the result of that expression, or the result of that calculation, will be to return its value as a string. So if I wrap up the closed parentheses at the end, and I can do exactly the same thing for each of these other values, so we'll take each of the numbers or dates and convert those into strings explicitly rather than implicitly, and then return those or store those in um, my string variable. So for this particular example, I won't see any difference whatsoever in what happens. I'll see the number one stored as a string, and then the number one stored as a string, and and then today's date again stored as a string. But as I say, a little later on in the video you'll see why that can be sometimes a useful necessary function. Now there is one particular thing that you can't convert into a string in VBA, either implicitly or explicitly, and that thing is a null. So just to demonstrate what I mean by that, if I were to comment out these three lines of code and then attempt to store a null in my string variable, s equals null. Now it's fairly pointless writing that instruction because that will never ever work. If I just hit F5 to run the entire procedure, it will fail immediately with a runtime error of invalid use of null when it hits that line. 
I can't do that even if I attempt to explicitly convert the null into a string. If I use cstr null, that still doesn't work because you simply can't convert nulls into string values. Nulls indicate the absence of any valid data whatsoever, and to be fair it's not likely that you'll encounter it that often in Excel VBA. It's more of a concept to do with databases, so if you were perhaps creating code that connected to a database and wrote a query on that database to return some data, some of the fields or columns in the database tables can contain nulls. And if you attempted to store that the value of the field in a string variable and the field contained null, then you'd run into problems. So we've got a video actually that explains how to connect to databases and query a database and return it back to an Excel workbook or some Excel VBA code. So if you're really, really interested in that, I'm not going to go into it in detail here because we've already created videos that explain all about working with databases in VBA. The solution to that sort of problem, if I just switch briefly back to the VBA code, is rather than attempting to convert it in every case, what you would do ordinarily is test if is null, and then you could pass in a reference to the field. So, for instance, let me just pass in the actual word null in this case, um, which, of course, that will always return true, that little expression there. So if that was the case, then what I could do instead is store an empty string so in VBA that would be open double quotes and close double quotes with nothing in between. Otherwise I would store the actual value of the field, so uh, no reference to field, let's just put in uh, that particular um, literal string just for convenience. So if I were to attempt to run this subroutine now using F8 to step through, you'll see that the S variable just retains an empty string. If this um, wasn't null, so let's put in a literal string there, and then I were to run the subroutine again, so if we use F8 to step through, we'll see this time it has the reference to the field. So that's the basic principle of how you get around that particular issue. Next, I'd just like to have a very quick look at a couple of different ways of declaring string variables. Now, the example we've used up at the top here is by far and away the most common way to declare a string variable. So you state the name of the variable, which in this case is nice and short and simple, s, followed by the word as and the data type you want to use, which in this case, of course, is string. Now, the as string part is actually somewhat redundant if you were using something called a type declaration character. So just to demonstrate how that would work, I'm going to comment out this, the statement that works with nulls, and then I'm going to uncomment the lines that we wrote at the start that assign various different values to our string. Then I'm going to comment out my dim s as string, just to keep that in there for reference, and I'm going to declare the same variable again in a shorter way, dim s, followed by a dollar sign. So the dollar sign is one example of a type declaration character, and the dollar sign indicates a string. So rather than saying as string, just use a dollar sign after your variable name. Now the name of the variable isn't s$, dollar. the name of the variable is still s, so should I want to reference it later on, then I still refer to it as the letter s. And again, if I use the F8 key to begin stepping through, with the locals window displayed, you see I've got a variable called s, its value is an empty string, and its data type, of course, is a string. But from that point on, it works in exactly the same way as our slightly more explicitly declared variable. So you can see the values get changed as I assign different values, and then it disappears at the end of the procedure. So obviously that's the more succinct way to declare your string variables, just using a single dollar sign rather than as string. The downside to that, of course, is that you need to remember what the type declaration characters are, and I find that far more difficult than just the actual literal names of the, of the data types like string or long or integer, etc. The other thing is that it makes it slightly more awkward for your users or other people reading your code to understand, so dim s dollar isn't particularly helpful less helpful, I think, than dim s as string. So you're welcome to use them, of course, they still work, and you do see them crop up from time to time in other people's code, so at least you understand what it is if you see it. But for the rest of this video, I'm going to carry on using the, the more explicit declaration as string. Another way to declare a string variable is to declare it as a fixed length string. So all the variables we've declared so far are variable length strings. You can store any amount of text up to about 2.147 billion characters, and the length of the string will be equal to the number of characters stored. The amount of memory taken up by your string variables is equal to is, is a number of bytes equal to the number of characters plus an overhead of 10 bytes to sort of help keep track of the, the variable size. So it's number of characters plus 10 bytes. A fixed length string, no matter how many characters you attempt to store in the string, will always have the exact number of characters you've declared. 
So to demonstrate how that works, let me comment out my dim s dollar variable, and instead I'm going to say dim s as string, and I'm going to set a fixed size of five characters. So I enter a multiply symbol, a, a, an asterisk, and then the number five, which in this case will allow me to store exactly five characters. Now, the maximum value, or maximum number of characters you can store in a fixed length string is only up to about 65,500, so it's significantly less than the variable length strings. The benefit of a fixed length string is that it, the amount of memory it takes up, the number of bytes it requires, is equal to the number of characters, so there isn't that 10 byte overhead. Now the amount of difference that makes in the real world when you're programming in VBA is so unbelievably minimal. You will never notice a difference, I think, in using fixed length or variable length strings. It's quite rare to see fixed length strings used in VBA. Um, just to demonstrate what the slight difference is, is if I were to use the F8 key to begin stepping through this, then you'll see that if I try to store anything you like up to about 2.147 billion characters, I don't know if you can also just about make out that the locals window sort of displays a placeholder of five characters. So even though I haven't put anything into the string variable yet, its length is, at the moment, still technically five. So if I use F8, it only stores the first five characters of that phrase, and likewise the workbook path, and then the sheet name, and the, sorry, the version number of the application, and then the sheet name, and so on and so on. So, um, of course, you'd only tend to use fixed length strings if you were working with a set of data whose length you knew was fixed. So perhaps you're working with specific code numbers that have a fixed length. You can save a sli the slight bit of a, or make a slight efficiency gain by using a fixed length string in those cases. Okay, what I'd like to do next is have a quick look at one of the most common operations you're likely to perform with strings, and that's concatenating them. Concatenating is simply joining two or more strings together to form a longer string, which doesn't seem particularly complicated, and you've, I'm sure you've done this many times in the past, but there are a few subtle little points to mention that you might not have encountered before. So let's have a new module for this, so I'm going to right click into the Project Explorer and choose Insert Module, and then the first subroutine in here will be called something basic like Basic Concatenation. I can spell that properly, Basic Concatenation. Okay, what we'll do here is we'll declare three separate string variables. So I'm going to say dim s1 as string, and then I'll also have s2 as string, I'll just declare them all on the same line for convenience, and you probably guessed it, s3 as string as well. If you prefer using a type declaration character, don't let me stop you. Feel free to use S1 dollar, S2 dollar, S3 dollar. And then I'm going to say S1 equals, not very inventive, but the letter A. S2 equals the letter B. And then S3 is simply going to be string 1 and string 2 joined together. So to make that work, all we need to do is say S1 followed by an ampersand. So the ampersand is the standard character for concatenation in VBA. And S2. All we're going to do then is We'll print them to the immediate window just to make life a little bit easier rather than stepping through and looking in the locals window. I'm going to say debug.print s3. So if I view the immediate window, if I head to the view menu and choose immediate window, and then just use the F5 key to run the entire procedure, I'll see that I end up with A and B joined together in a single string rather than separately as we originally assigned them. It's worth mentioning that there is a different concatenation character you could use. It's actually the same character you'd use for adding numbers together. You can replace the ampersand with a plus symbol. So as long as the two values involved are both strings, then if I were to run that subroutine, we'll end up with the same result down at the bottom. Now some languages don't have a separate concatenation character like VBA does, so the ampersand will always concatenate. The plus symbol won't always concatenate with strings. You'll see an example of why it's better practice to use the ampersand rather than the plus symbol later on, but it's worthwhile mentioning that you can use plus rather than ampersand to concatenate strings. Now, of course, it's not just literal strings that you can write in your code that can be concatenated. You can concatenate any two strings or more strings together. So let's have a quick look if we make a new subroutine. In fact, I'm going to copy the entire subroutine we've just written. And let's say something like concatenate string values. So, con sorry, concatenate cell values is what I was trying to say there. So concatenate cell values will have the same three string variables, S1, 2, and 3. I'll make sure that I've selected a 
range in sheet one first of all. So I'm going to say sheet one dot select followed by range. Now it doesn't really matter for the sake of demonstration. We can pick any cell in column A here. Let's go first cell A9 for instance dot select. And then rather than assigning a literal string to my S1 variable, I'm going to make S1 to be equal to the active cell dot value. And then I'll make string two equal to the active cell dot offset zero comma three dot value. So the value in the cell that's three columns to the right of the cell in column A will be one, two, three, the cell which contains the runtime in minutes for the particular film that I've selected. So having done that, I'm going to concatenate S1 and S2 together, but I'd also like to have some kind of separator character in between them. So what I'm going to do is concatenate an additional literal string in between these two, which I'll just make into a, a comma followed by a space. So the name of the film will be separated from its runtime with a comma and a space character. So having done all that, if I were simply to press F5 to run the entire thing, I'll say get some information. Oh, so I picked Pearl Harbor. Sorry about that. Um, but Pearl Harbor is 183 minutes long, so that's basic concatenation with cell values. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the difference between using ampersand and using the plus symbol to concatenate strings. So let's have a new subroutine just down below. I'm going to give myself a little bit more space so you can read this a little more clearly and create a new subroutine below using uh, called I don't know, concatenation, uh, sorry, concatenation operators. Should have picked a shorter name for the procedure there. Okay, so um, the basics of concatenation we already know. Rather than using variables this time, I'm just going to jump straight into debug.printing. Now, of course, if I said debug.print uh, a ampersand b, then run that one. That will, of course, give me the letters a, b in the immediate window. And again, if I were to use a plus symbol rather than ampersand, then of course that will give me exactly the same result when I run it. So we knew that, we've established that already. The same is true if I choose to concatenate two numbers. If I say debug.print and then say, uh, let's go for, if I say two ampersand two, so I'm going to enter them as, as numeric values rather than strings. If I were to debug.print that, let me just comment out the previous one so we don't get lots of ABs, then I'll end up with 22. Um, and the same will be true if I were to use um, double quotes wrapped around those numbers, I'll get 22 rather than um, 4, as you might expect. So if I were using a plus symbol, however, to do this, if I've entered both values as literal strings wrapped up in size double quotes, then the result of that is the same as the concatenation using the ampersand. The difference, of course, is if these are entered as numeric values, then, of course, you get what you expect. It wouldn't be 2 out of 2 is not 22, 2 add 2 is 4, of course. Now the, the weird thing about this is that even if one of the two values is a literal string and the other one is a numeric value, then what you end up with is the result 4. So this is where the, the plus symbol kind of breaks down a little bit. If it's definitely concatenation you're interested in, if you definitely want to join one bit of text to another bit of text, then it's absolutely vital to use the ampersand symbol. That's the one that's always going to reliably join two strings together rather than try to arithmetically add things. So that's what we're going to go with for the rest of the video. Using the plus symbol can cause problems when concatenating the values of cells as well. So I've just cleared out the contents of the immediate window by clicking into it, pressing Ctrl and A and then delete to remove everything. And then if I just comment out the debug.print2 and 2, what I'm going to do now is debug.print the same phrase that we were generating in one of the previous routines. So let's in fact just go ahead back up and copy and paste a couple of bits of text from here. So if we take the active cell value rather than type it all out, followed by an ampersand, and then an open double quotes, comma space, close double quotes, another ampersand, and then the active cell offset 0, 0,3 value. Of course, you probably could have just typed that out just as quickly as copying and pasting it. But using ampersands always guarantees that we're always going to try to concatenate the values. If I were to run that one, I'll end up with more information about Pearl Harbor, sadly, but anyway, there we go. If I were to replace these with plus symbols instead, now if I replace the first ampersand with a plus symbol, nothing um, goes wrong, everything is absolutely perfectly happy, so it's going to just concatenate the first bit of text with the next bit of text. These two values are both strings of text, so the even though I'm using a plus symbol, because they're both strings, they're both concatenated rather than arithmetically added. However, if I replace the second one with a plus symbol and then try to run this one again, I'm going to end up with a type mismatch error. So now what 
what Excel is trying to do is arithmetically add the number of the cell 183 to the phrase Pearl Harbor comma space and that of course can't possibly ever work. So there's another pot potential issue with using plus rather than ampersands. Now one way to get around this would be to use the CSTR function, the C string function, to convert every value into a string before it's concatenated. So I could, if I really wanted to, copy and paste that line and then rather than trying to concatenate the number stored in that cell I could concatenate the string version of that number from that cell. If I comment out the previous line because we know this one isn't going to work and then run that subroutine we'll end up with the result we'd expect. Which is all okay until I try to select another cell which contains a number. So let's say just before that line I'm going to say range a128 dot select. I'm picking this one for a very particular reason dot select and then if I were to step through this routine up to this point you'll see that cell A128 contains the film 300. Great movie if you haven't seen it um, but that value is stored as a number rather than as text so again if I try to execute this line again using plus symbols I get another type mismatch because it's now trying to add a number to a string which of course isn't going to work. So again, I could make sure that I explicitly convert the cell's value into a string first and then run that subroutine again and this time it will work. I get the film 300 with a runtime of 117 minutes. But why on earth you would want to go to these extraordinary lengths when you could have just replaced the plus symbols with ampersands in the first place, I'm not entirely sure. So you don't need to convert um, strings when you're using or convert values to strings when you're using ampersands. That just works automatically regardless of what the original value was. It will concatenate rather than add. Now as well as being able to concatenate some string literals and properties of objects, VBA also has some string constants for special characters, things like tabs and new line characters, that sort of thing. So just as a very quick demonstration, let's clear the contents of the immediate window first, and we'll have a new subroutine just below. Let's call this one something like concatenate tabs, and that gives you a clue about what we're about to do. So similar idea, in fact if I just copy and paste from the previous routine, the debug.print a and b, and I'm going to switch this to using the ampersand again, as I've said we're going to focus on the ampersand rather than the plus symbol from now on. Um, if I want to do, if I ex execute that of course I just get the letters a and b. If I wanted a tab character to be inserted in between those two, I can concatenate the value of a constant. So in this case the constant's name is vb tab, which is fairly convenient and quick and easy to remember. So if I were to execute this subroutine now, I'd end up with letters A and B with a tab stop in between them. Now that might not appear to be all that useful immediately, but imagine you were trying to generate some data to be stored in a text file and you wanted to generate some tab delimited data. Using VB tab characters is exactly how you would go about doing that. Now I'm not going to go to the whole point of creating a text file and showing you all the things associated with that. Again, we have a video from earlier in the series that explains all about generating text files, whether it's comma separated values or tab delimited files. But just to give you the basic principles, imagine I wanted to create a single row of data based on one row from this film list and each value from each column I wanted to be separated with a tab character. One simplistic way I could do that is by looping over all the cells in a row and joining them all together with a bit of concatenation. So the simplest way to do that, let's just get rid of the debug.print name in there and I'd create a couple of variables first of all. So when I'd create a variable that would be a string variable and I'll use that to hold the entire string of all the film information and then I'd have another one that I'm going to call R and this one's going to be a range and assuming that I've already selected a cell in column A what I'm going to do is loop over all of the cells so I'm going to say for each R in and then I'm going to refer to a range that's from the active cell all the way to the end of the list in a rightwards direction so if I pressed control and the right arrow key that would jump all the way across to the right hand side of that block of data so that assumes there are no gaps in the list of course so what I can do here is say for each R in range active cell comma active cell dot end excel to right. Beg pardon, I'll get that in the correct direction. And then I'll enter next R to make sure I move on to the next cell in that row. And for each row I would like to essentially build up a string in the single string variable. So I want to make the string variable equal to whatever it currently contains. So I'm going to make it equal to itself. 
along with the value of the current cell that I'm looking at, so that's going to be r.value, and then another ampersand, and then I finally want to insert a tab character after the value of that cell. So that's where I can say VB tab. What I can then do right at the end after the loop is finished is I could either say debug.print s, or I could say message box s, for instance, if I want to display it temporarily on a message box. And of course, in the real world, you'd be writing this information out into a text file, as that video, as I pointed out earlier on, uh, describes, so part 23 text files. So, if I was just to execute this subroutine, assuming that I've got a cell in column A selected already, if I run this one now, I'll see my message box pops up and I've got a tab character between each individual value. And if I look into the immediate window as well, I can see hopefully exactly the same thing there. We can achieve a similar result, but inserting new line characters instead of tabs. So let's just copy this entire subroutine and then paste it in immediately down below. And if I were to change the name of it so it says something like concatenate new lines, and then of course we want to change the character that we're, we're um, concatenating here, rather than a VB tab. The one that I'm going to use in this case, the one that you're most likely to see in the real world, is VB new line. Now that's not the only constant you can use to generate a new line, but it is the most common one, and I think it's the one you should use. I'll explain why in just a moment. But once again, if I were to just execute that entire subroutine, what we ought to end up with is a message box this time with a new line for each individual value. And again, in the immediate window, we've got each value on a separate row in the immediate window as well. One thing that's worthwhile quickly noting about both of these two previous routines is that we get an extra special character right at the very end of the string that we're building, so that we get an extra tab here, we get an extra new line character here, and that's not immediately apparent when you display it on a message box or print it to the immediate window. But if you were writing these values out to, for instance, text files or even cells in Excel, then you might see a slightly different effect. So just to demonstrate that, let's have a quick modification to this concatenate new lines routine where after we finish looping, what we'll do is generate a new worksheet. So we'll say worksheets.add and then below that we'll say active cell.value equals the value of our s string variable. So the active cell will be range A1 on the new worksheet that's just been created as that's made the active sheet automatically. If I just comment out the debug.print and the message box lines, and it might be easy to see from here, if I run the subroutine, we ought to see on the new worksheet that's generated, even though the data in that cell is sitting, is organized or formatted to sit at the bottom of the cell, you can see there's a blank line character sitting below. So if I wanted to remove that, I wanted to avoid that from appearing in the first place, what I could do is write a quick simple if function into my string con concatenation. So sp switching back to the VB editor, rather than always adding a new line character, I'd only want to add a new line character as long as the value of the cell one column to the right isn't an empty cell. So I can do that in a couple of different ways, but I think an if function is a simple, convenient way to do it. So I'm going to add to my concatenation IIF, open some round brackets, and we can say if r dot offset, try that again, offset to zero comma one dot value equals, excuse me, I'll get this spelt correctly, one column across, not ten columns across, and if that is equal to an empty string, then what I would like to do is concatenate an empty string to the end of the, uh, the line. Otherwise, I want to add in the new line character. So when there is another value to add in to the string, I'll put a new line in. Otherwise, I'll put an empty string in. What I can do now if I were to run the subroutine is, you can hopefully see if I were to zoom in and just change the width of that a little bit, I'm now sitting that text to the bottom of the cell and there's no blank line character at the bottom. And hopefully you can see the difference if I switch between the two different worksheets. So one thing to, to watch out for in case you are using this technique to build up a string using either tabs or new line characters. Now, as it turns out, VB new line isn't the only way you can insert a new line character into a string. If I just do a little bit of tidying up, first of all, in the immediate window, if I select all the text in there and delete it, then I'm just going to tidy up these extra two worksheets by selecting them and then right-clicking and deleting them. And I'll confirm that I want to do that. What I'm going to do instead is create another brand new blank worksheet. I'll just do this manually for the time being. And what I'd like to do is create a few different bits of um, concatenations, a few different concatenations, sorry, that join together a simple bit of text, so that is A and B, but using different new line characters in between. So I'm going to go back to the VB editor at that point, and scrolling down a little bit, let's add a new subroutine, and we'll call this one something along the lines of adding new lines. 
So we'll start with the first way. We'll create a couple of variables first of all. Let's say dim s1 as string, comma s2 as string, and then finally s3 as string using our inventive naming system. And then I'm going to set F1, S1 to be equal to the letter A and S2 to be equal to the letter B. It doesn't really matter what values you use for, the, for this example. And then S3, of course, is going to be equal to S1 and then an ampersand. And I'm going to go with a VB new line character first and then another ampersand and then finally S2. So that will join all those three things together into a single string. Having done that, what I want to display that piece of information in three different ways. First of all, I'd like to debug.print it, so that will appear in the immediate window. So I'll say debug.print S3, and then I'd also like to set its, um, paste its value into, or change the value of a cell to be equal to the, the value of S3. So I'm going to say, in this case, I'm going to say range A1 dot value equals S3. So I'll go for value rather than validation, and that's equal to S3. And then finally, we'll show it on a message box as well. Now, once I've set all that up, I'm just going to run this subroutine to begin with using the VB new line character. And you'll see, hopefully, in three different places, I've got a new line for A and B in the cell, a new line for A and B on the message box, and also a new line for A and B in the immediate window. Now, there is an alternative constant you can use to join a new line in. So rather than saying VB new line, if I just select that text, remove it, and then press Control and Space again, I can look for something called a VBCRLF. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that. Um, it stands for Visual Basic Carriage Return Line Feed, which is an alternative character that you can use. Let's change the, uh, the range that I'm referring to this line to A2. And then if I run the subroutine again using F5, I'll see once again the cell contains A and B on different lines. A and B on different lines in the message box, and A and B on different lines in the immediate window. Now there are two shorter forms of this as well. There's there's VBCR and there's VBLF. So let's just try VBLF to begin with. So if I say VBLF, which is just Visual Basic Line Feed. Now let's just change the cell reference so it's A3, and then run that subroutine again. And once again, two lines in the cell, two lines in the message box, two lines in the immediate window. Let's change it again. We'll go for the VBCR. Visual Basic Carriage Return. Now this one's going to get generate slightly different results. If I switch the cell to it to refer to range A4 this time, then if I run the subroutine again, I'll get. You can hopefully see in the background already the range, the value of the range to the cell in the Excel worksheet gets A and B on a single line. But on the message box, I get A and B on separate lines, and in the immediate window, I get A and B on separate lines as well. Now, if you're starting to get worried by just how many different ways there are to generate a new line and wondering about which one to pick, don't worry. The simple rule is always pick VB new line in VBA. There's no reason whatsoever these days for the other versions, VBCRLF and CR and LF by themselves. VB new line is really all you'll ever need in VBA. If you're interested in why there are so many different versions of new line characters, it all kind of stems from um, a historical machine called a teleprinter. There's a nice Wikipedia article here. Um, basically, the only thing you need to know to understand it is that a teleprinter had a physical print head, a carriage, which scrolled along the page to print characters. And to generate a new line, the carriage had to return to the left, so carriage return. Then the paper had to feed by one line, so that's the line feed. So to generate a new line in a teleprinter, there were two control characters passed to the system, a carriage return and a line feed, usually in that order. Now when computing systems came in to replace teleprinters, they realised they didn't really need a separate carriage return and line feed character to generate a new line on a, on a visual monitor. So the, uh, the control characters were broken down into carriage returns and line feeds, CRs and LFs. There's a separate nice article here about control characters, again on Wikipedia. So some systems opted to choose LF, the line feed, and that was uh, for most Unix systems, as you can see here, the line feed character. And then carriage returns were adopted by classic Mac OS, um, and then also the um, predecessor to DOS, so CPM80, and so DOS, and then hence Windows, by extension. So um, the reason why there are different types is because different systems used different characters to denote a new line. Um, so <laughs> these days, it doesn't really matter just in VBA, just use VB new line. You really, really, really don't need to know the other ones. If you did want to show off, however, you wanted to look at the uh, the, the actual ASCII codes for the carriage return line feeds, then that's number 13 for a carriage return and 10 for a line feed. If you really wanted to impress somebody, um, did I say impress? <laughs> I'm not sure impress is the right word, um, but you could actually concatenate those actual characters rather than a 
than a, a constant, you could use the chr function, which generates a character by passing in the ASCII code. So chr13 would be the carriage return, and then another ampersand, and chr10, and then the next string. So that would effectively choose the, uh, uh, generate the exact same results. Let's just set that to be um, range A5, so you can see the results. Run that subroutine one more time, I get A and B on separate lines, A and B on separate lines, and A and B on separate lines. But only, only, only ever use that if you're trying to impress somebody or, or, or maybe confuse somebody as well. Okay, so for the next part of the video, I'd like to move on to look at how you compare strings. So what I'm going to do is generate a new module for that, and if I right-click and choose Insert Module, and we'll have a new subroutine called Substring Comparisons. This is just for the basic introduction to comparing strings. I'm also going to switch back to Sheet 1 because we're going to use a lot of the text in column A for our string comparisons. But the very first thing I'd quickly like to do is just establish how VBA treats strings of text in terms of case sensitivity. So let's have a quick couple of uh, couple of variables, beg your pardon. So I'm going to say dim as important as string again, and just S2 this time as string. We won't bother with a third. I'm going to set S1 to be equal to the letter A, and then, sorry, that was meant to be, uh, yes, sorry, yes, and then S2 equal to the letter A as well, so rather than A and B this time, I'll make them the same thing. And then what I'd like to do is say, if S1 equals S2, then debug.print the same, else debug.print different. I'll get there eventually, there we go. So the key to this is understanding how VBA treats characters of different cases. Currently, we've got both characters in the same case, so both in lowercase. So if I were to just clear the immediate window to give us a bit more space, and then run that subroutine, we'd end up with A and A being exactly the same. If, however, one of these changed to a capital letter, and I try to run that one again, then I end up with um, the, the result being different. So by default, VBA treats characters with different cases as different to each other. Now there are a couple of different ways in which you can make string comparisons case insensitive in VBA. The first technique we'll look at is making string comparisons case insensitive for the entire module, so for any subroutine whatsoever in this entire module. To do that we can add an option statement to the top of the module, just like option explicit. If we add option compare text, that makes all string comparisons in this module case insensitive. So if I were to run this subroutine again, in fact let me just clear the immediate window, if I run this subroutine again, even though these um, strings are in different cases, when I run it, now VBA treats them as the same. And of course they'll still be the same even if they're in uh, lowercase, of course they're always the same now, it doesn't matter which combination of cases we use, as long as the strings are spelt the same, we'll always get the same. Now the default option here is option compare binary, so rather than option compare text, option compare binary is the default where strings are case insensitive, sorry, big pardon, case sensitive. So again, if I've got this one done now and I change, uh, run the subroutine again, I get different, and of course uh, these will be the same because they're the same case, and then these will be different again because they're in different cases. Now one of the biggest dangers of using the option compare statement is if you start copying and pasting code between different modules, those modules might have different settings for their option compare statement. So what I prefer to do myself in the real world is ignore the option compare statement entirely and assume that by default every string comparison is case sensitive. You can then treat each comparison on a case by case basis and if you need to make it case insensitive there's a couple of different approaches you can use to do that. So what I'll do here is I'm going to copy and paste this line of code and I'd like to make this comparison case insensitive. So I can achieve that by converting both strings into the same case. And there's a couple of functions that allow me to do that in VBA. I can convert everything into all uppercase text by using the ucase function. So I say ucase s1 and compare that with the ucase of s2. So I might not know what case the text is in in both those. So if I convert everything in that string to uppercase, everything in that string to uppercase, just clear the immediate window to demonstrate the difference here. So these two strings are in different cases at the moment. I'm in binary compare mode, which means, means it's case sensitive. So the first statement returns different, the second one returns the same. The other function you can use here is to convert text to lowercase. So in this case, um, pun not really intended, but anyway, um, if L case S1 equals L case S2, then once again we'll see the exact same things. If I run that subroutine again, the first one is different because it's case sensitive, the second one is the same because it's case insensitive. 
Now all the comparisons we've done so far are essentially asking if one string is exactly the same as another string. But what if you want to do something a bit more sophisticated than that? So even something quite simple, let's say I wanted to find all the films that begin with the letter K, for example. There's a couple of different ways you can approach that, but what I'd like to do now is start using this list of films to return some slightly more interesting results. So let's start by creating another new subroutine. So let's call this something like um, wildcard comparisons. And if you're familiar with the term wildcard, then you'll probably know what's coming at this point. So each, each time I make a comparison here, I'd like to loop through the entire list of film names. So to do that, I'm going to use a range variable, dim r as range. And I'm going to say for each r in, I'm going to assume that I'm on sheet 1 whenever I run this subroutine, so I'm not going to qualify this with the uh, with the worksheet name. I'm just going to say for each R in range, A2, so that's the top cell in the list which contains a film name, and then the bottom cell in the list I can reference in a variety of ways. I'm going to reference it by saying A1.endXL down. So if I were in cell A1 in the worksheet and I pressed control down arrow, that jumps down to the last cell in the list. Assuming that the list is continuous and it doesn't have any breaks in it, any gaps, that will select the last populated cell in that column. So, assuming that's the case, what I can now do is say for each R in range A2, comma, range A1, which is the top cell in the list, dot end, XL down, and then close two sets of parentheses. What I can then do is say next R to make sure I move on to the next one. And I'm going to write a simple if statement inside this for each loop, which is going to check if the value of the cell that I'm looking at matches a particular pattern. So if, for example, I want to do something really quick and simple, I could say if r.value equals, and if I look for exactly the, the, the name King Kong, so there are several films in the list called King Kong, then and I can say end if at the bottom. What I would like to do is debug.print the name of the film and also its um, its release date, which is in the, the column the cell that's one column to the right. So I can say debug.print r.value an ampersand, then in some double quotes, maybe a comma and a space, another ampersand, and finally r.offset 0,1.value. Okay, so just to check that this is working, you notice that I've used capital K's here to make sure that it's spelt the same way. Another approach I could take using the same technique we've just talked about is I could use the L case function to convert all of the film name into lowercase text and then write out the, the string I'm looking for in all lowercase text as well. If I were to just simply run this one, we'll loop through the entire list of films and print out all the films who are called King Kong and the release dates of those films. OK, so that's not really any different to what we've done in the very first procedure in this module. Let's do the more interesting comparisons then. Let's say, as I said, I wanted to find all the films whose name begins with the letter K. Now, one way to do this is using some awkward functions. So what I could try to do is extract the first letter from the film name and then check if that is equal to the letter K. So one way that I could do this, let's just copy and paste that if statement. We'll do this quite a few times in this little module, in this little subroutine in fact. So I'm going to copy and paste the if statement, comment out the first one. I'd just like to keep a record of all the things we've done so far. And rather than comparing the entire value of the cell, what I want to do is compare just the, the first letter of the value of that cell. So one way to extract the first letter is to use a function called left. So if I say, if the L case of the left of the value of the cell, and I want to return just one single character from the left. So after r.value, I can enter the number one and close an extra set of parentheses. And then if that is equal to the letter k in lowercase, let's get rid of everything else except for the letter k. So this bit of the function here, or this bit of the expression, I should say, returns the first letter from the left of the cell's value. This function, of course, as we know, converts it into lowercase letters, and this will compare it against the low, lowercase letter k. Let me just clear the contents of the immediate window, and then run that subroutine again, and you'll find that we get a list of all the films that begin with the letter k. So, some good and some not-so-good films in that list there. Now, of course, this technique works, although it's a little bit unwieldy, and it's much trickier to do more sophisticated pattern matches as well. So let's look at what we're attempting to achieve with this, um, this subroutine using wildcard comparisons. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to write this new criterion from scratch. Let me just comment out that if statement, and we'll try to return the exact same list of films, but we'll do it in a much more elegant way. I would like to say if L case r.value 
and then I'm going to use an operator called like. So rather than asking if it is exactly equal to something, the like operator lets me make pattern matches. So what I'd like to say is when the value of the film name is like, a string which begins with a lowercase letter k, remember we've converted it to lowercase, followed by any sequence of characters whatsoever. So if I enter in an asterisk, a star symbol, the star symbol, the asterisk, represents any number of any characters. It's referred to as a wildcard character, so it could represent anything. If that's true, then what I would like to do is print out the film's name. So let me just, it again, delete the contents of the immediate window, and then click back into the subroutine and run that one one more time, and we'll get exactly the same list that we re retrieved earlier on, but a much simpler way to do it. It's a much more elegant, simple um, string uh, line of code to generate the same results. One of the nice things about this particular technique is it's much easier to create more sophisticated patterns as well. So it's very simple to change if I wanted to, for instance, find all films that end with the letter K rather than begins with. If I change where the asterisk is positioned in the string, so it's asterisk K, so that's any sequence of any characters followed by the letter K at the end, just clear the contents of the immediate window, and then I could run that one again. I'll find this time I get all films that end with the letter K rather than begin with. So again, an interesting mix of some good and some bad, but you can see that all the film names in that list end with the letter K. This also works, of course, for more than just a single character. So rather than the letter K, let's look for films that begin with the word King. So let's take the asterisk away from the start and then say King followed by the asterisk. And then again, clear the contents of the media window and then run that one again. And we'll end up with all the films whose name begins with the word King. So that includes ones that, that aren't broken by a space. So you get King's Man so um, and Kingdom of Heaven. If you wanted to find films that began just with the actual word king, so king followed by a space, for example, then you could simply say king space asterisk, and then if I were to clear the contents of the immediate window and scroll back to the left, that was an accidental click there, and then run that one again, I'll end up with all the films whose first word is the word king. You can expand on this again and now search for films which contain the word king. So rather than begins with or ends with, the word king could appear anywhere in the film's title. So to achieve that, all we need to do this time is put an asterisk at the start of the word king, and then another asterisk at the end of the word king, and I'll remove the, the space there as well so I get the word king anywhere in the film name. Clear the contents of the immediate window again, just increase the height of that window a little bit so we can see some more results. Run that one one more time, and we'll end up with even more results. So you can see the word king appearing in several perhaps unexpected places and if you scroll through the list you'll find all sorts of different films in that list. Oh, sadly, sadly including two Twilight movies, I forgot about those. Oh, I've forgotten I put those in there. Um, anyway, that actually leads, leads us on to another neat thing you can do, excluding particular values. So if I wanted to exclude films that contain the word Twilight from my list, I can do that by changing the criterion. So let's have a quick go. I'm going to copy this if statement this time and then make a new version of this. So I'll comment out this one just to keep it in there for reference. And if I paste it in down below, what I can do now is say if not lksr.value like and then enter the word Twilight anywhere in the list. Okay, so if I were to clear the contents of the immediate window and then run that subroutine again, it's a little less easy to see the results here because there are so many films, there are about 1,200 films in the list. So you can guarantee that there aren't any Twilight films left in that list now, which can only be a good thing um, if only we could do that in the real world. Now it's a little bit less easy to see the results here, so what might be nice to do is combine the um, films that do contain the word King, but not those that contain the word Twilight. So to combine criteria, let's copy and paste a couple of the previous lines we've written. I want to find all the films that contain the word King, but don't contain the word Twilight. So let's copy the previous line and then paste that in. Now I can comment out the line I've just copied there. And then what I can do is take the relevant part from the previous line. So I'm searching for films where the title is like King. So I can copy that part out. And it doesn't really matter which side I place this one. I'm going to place this one just after the if keyword on this line and then I can join the two criteria together using the word AND. Now it is important here to make sure you've included three elements to each criterion, so you must have a comparison operator, which in this case is the word LIKE, and then you must have a value either side of that. So the value on the left-hand side is the lowercase version of the film's name, and the, version, and the, sorry, the value on the right-hand side is the phrase KING with asterisks surrounding it.
then the AND operator to join on another criterion, which in this case has a comparison operator, and a value on the left hand side, and a value on the right hand side. What's really tempting in plain English is to do something like this, where you take away the, the L case R dot value when you're writing this from scratch rather than copy pasting. If I just cut that part to the clipboard, in plain English that sounds like it makes sense. If the L case of the range's value is like king and is not like twilight, then do something. Plain English makes perfect sense, but to VBA, nonsense. If you try to click away from that line you'll see you get a, a syntax error, it's highlighted in red, you can't do this, because this second comparison is essentially missing its first value. So in between the not and the like there I've got to place this um, bit of text back in again. Okay, so having done that let's just cut or clear the contents of the, of the immediate window and then back into the subroutine, run it one more time and we'll end up with all the films that contain the word king except for, happily, those that contain the word twilight and we can all sleep a little bit easier knowing that that's the case. Now as it turns out the asterisk isn't the only wildcard character you can use, there's a variety of other ones as well. So where the asterisk represents any number of any characters, there's another wildcard that represents any one single character. So let's just comment out that line and what I'd like to do this time is search for any film which contains any string of text but ends with a single character. So for instance, just looking at the list I've got here, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 ends with a single character, so there's a space followed by a single character. So if I wanted to establish or loop through or list out films that have that kind of pattern, I could say if L case R dot value like, I spell like properly, there we go, then in some double quotes I could say begins with any number of any characters, so that would be an asterisk, followed by a space, and then ends with just one single character by itself, so that would be represented by a question mark. So each question mark character that you type in represents one single character. So let's go with a single question mark for now, and then close that, and then say then, and if we then were to clear the contents of the immediate window, and then run the subroutine again, what we ought to end up with is a little bit difficult to see having added in the, um, the date at the end, but each of these films has just a single character at the end. So most of them are going to be film sequels with, uh, with numbers, but oh there we go, well, there's a different one, there's um, American History X. District 9 isn't actually um, a sequel, it's not after District 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Um, good movie, worth watching actually. Um, then you can see a few more examples of that, but there's always, always just a single solitary character at the end of that string. Now as I said you can use more than just one single question mark to, to represent characters. So let's say we wanted to find any films that have a word or have a title that ends with a three letter word. So I've got a, an asterisk representing any characters, then a space, then the last three characters, question mark, question mark, question mark. If I've done that and again clear the contents of the immediate window and then run that one again, what we ought to end up with this time are films whose last word is three letters long, so you can see that that's absolutely the case. Just going back to a single question mark again and, and clearing the contents of the immediate window, we saw that that question mark can represent any character, so that could be a number, a bit of text, or even a punctuation character if there were one at the end, so like a question mark for instance, or an exclamation mark, although there wouldn't be a space before any of those characters, so you wouldn't see any of those crop up in this particular example. What if you were only interested in numbers, so you didn't want to include things like American History X or the King and I, so it could only end with a number, a single digit. To make that work, what we could do is replace the question mark with another wildcard. Let's just copy that line again and paste it in immediately down below. And then this time, rather than using a question mark character, we'll use a hash symbol instead. If I clear the contents of the immediate window one more time, and then run this one, what we'll end up with this time are only films that end with a single digit. So you won't see The King and I, you won't see American History X, etc, etc. Now we've seen three wildcard characters used so far, the asterisk, the question mark, and the hash symbol. What if you wanted to find a string that contained one of those symbols? So some of our film names, for instance, end with a question mark. If I wanted to find films that end with a question mark, that's a little bit tricky at this point. If I just copy that line and then paste it in again and comment out the previous version. Let's say I want to find any film that contains any string of text, so an asterisk, but ends with a question mark character. 
The problem with that, of course, is that because the question mark represents a single character of any description, that basically returns every single one of the 1200 films, so that's not particularly useful. Um, what I can do instead, then, to treat the question mark character as an actual literal string, is I can wrap it up in a set of square brackets inside the string. So that would be asterisk, square brackets, question mark, square brackets. If I remove the contents of the immediate window again, getting bored of doing that by now, and then run the subroutine one more time, we'll see this time we've got only films whose last character is a question mark. OK, let's try something else yet again. Let's say this time I want to find films that begin with any of these three letters, A, M or G. They just happen to be my initials, so that's why I'm using those. Feel free to try a different set of initials to get a different set of results. But currently, knowing what I know, there's not much choice other than by combining multiple different criteria. So what I could do, if I were to just copy this one again, and then paste it in down below, what I can say is, if L case R dot value like star a, and then I could use an or operator this time, so we used and earlier on to combine two criteria that must both be met in order to return some results, we can use an or operator to combine criteria where either of them must return true. So if there is, so if the film's first letter, beg pardon, I meant to say a asterisk rather than asterisk a as well by the way, so if the first letter is like a star, or, paste that in, it's like M star, and then paste it in with it after an OR again, so I type in OR, paste it in again, OR G star. So if it begins with either A or M or G, if I just clear the contents of the immediate window, and then run that one again, then I get any films that begin with any of those three letters. That's a pretty tedious way of doing things, particularly if I've got more than two or three, that's even worse. So let's comment that one out and show you the much easier way to achieve that using some pattern matching again. So I can simply say if L case, excuse me, I should have just copied and pasted this, but never mind, if L case R dot value like, and then if I want to refer to a number of different characters in a sequence, I can wrap them up in a set of square brackets. So square brackets, AMG, close square brackets, followed by an asterisk, double quotes, then. So this will do exactly the same as the previous example. It will find any, any film name that begins with A or M or G, followed by any sequence of any characters. And just to prove it, let's clear the contents of the immediate window again, run that subroutine one more time, and you'll get exactly the same list of results. Now, if the letters you were testing for were in a continuous sequence, so not like here, A, M, and G don't sit next to each other in the alphabet, of course, but if it was, say, I don't know, J, K, L, and M, those were the first letters you wanted to see. Well, that's even easier to achieve. There's even less typing to do for things like that. So if I copy and paste that line, and then comment out the previous one yet again, and then this time I'm going to say, what does I say, J, K, L, M? I can say J dash M. So J to M followed by an asterisk, so that will find any film that begins with the letters J, K, L, or M, followed by any number of characters. Let's just clear the contents of the immediate window again, and one more time, give that one a quick test, and hopefully you can see clearly you've got uh, J's, K's, and L's, and M's in that list there. Whenever you've used these square brackets to contain a character sequence, you can always reverse the logic, and you can do that in a couple of different ways as well. If I just copy that line, so currently we're looking at all the films that begin, excuse me, let's just try that again, copy that line rather than um, replace it with the letter C, and then comment that one out and paste it in just down below. So currently we were looking at all films that begin with either the letters J, K, L, or M. If I wanted to see all the films that don't begin with any of those letters, I could say either. If not, L case R dot value like J to M, and then clear the contents of the immediate window again, and then run that one one more time. Slightly longer list than usual, but if you wanted to pick through it, you should find that you don't have any of those uh, letters. Alternatively, what I could have done, again, if I just copy, in fact, I'll just comment out the line rather than copying it again, and then paste it in down below. An alternative way to achieve the same thing is to begin the character sequence inside the square brackets with an exclamation mark symbol. So the exclamation mark symbol represents not effectively. So if you wanted to run that one again, just clear the contents of the immediate window and then do that one more time, we'll see exactly the same list of films again. Not quite so easy to see, agreed, um, but if you want to scroll through the list one more time, you're more than welcome just to check that you don't get any of those um, characters again. 
Now, although we've looked at most of these techniques individually, there's nothing to stop you from combining pretty much all the techniques we've just looked at here in a single um, comparison. So let's just comment, in fact, if I just copy this one first, beg your pardon, and then comment that line out, and then paste that one in down below. And what I'm gonna do is replace my entire like string. So what we're gonna do this time, I would like to search for any film that begins with a single character of any description, followed by a space. Then I would like to make sure that the next character, so the first letter of the second word, is definitely not an H. So in a set of square brackets, I can say exclamation mark H, close square brackets. Then I would like to follow that with any sequence of characters. And then at some point, I want to make sure I can find an apostrophe S space. So I'm going to type in a single quote, followed by a space, uh, sorry, by an S, followed by a space. And then finally, the last four characters, or the last word of the uh, the film title, must contain exactly four characters. So we have one, two, three, four question marks. So I appreciate it's not combining absolutely all the techniques, but a big, um, or a large number of them, all in one single comparison. So if I close or clear the contents of the immediate window one last time, and then run that subroutine, I ought to end up with two films. Both begin with a single character followed by a space, followed by any number of characters with a, an apostrophe S space, and then a final word with a four letter, sorry, the final word of the title with four letters in it. Okay, so that's uh, probably a little bit more elaborate than you're ever going to use in the real world, but just to show, just to show you what's possible with these uh, wild cards and, and comparison matches. Okay, well that's basically it for this introductory video on working with strings in VBA. Hopefully you found some of that useful and you uh, learnt at least one or two new things. I'm, I'd hate to think you were sitting there through the whole video thinking, well I know all this already. Anyway, what we'll do for the next video, or maybe even the next two or three videos in the series, is move on to have a look at some of the more interesting, useful text functions in a bit more detail. We've looked at a couple of them briefly in this video. We looked at L case and U case, and we also saw the left function a little earlier on as well. There are many, many more string functions available in VBA. If I have a quick preview by looking in the view menu and looking into the object browser, there's a VBA library which you can select from the top drop-down list in the object browser. And then a bit further down in that list, there's a, a class called strings. And in there is a whole great big long list of different string functions. So what we're going to be doing later on in this uh, series is, is investigating some of the more useful ones of those and explaining what they're for and how you might apply them to real world examples. So hopefully you'll join us for some of those videos. Thanks for watching this one. See you next time. If you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources, including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching. See you next time.